Hi, I'm Megan Follows, and you are listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Welcome back to another episode of You Might Know Her From. I am one of your hosts. I am Damien. I'm Anne. I'm the other one. I'm over here. And if you are new to our podcast, this is a show where we, longtime best friends, comedy adjacent collaborators, <laughs> uh, pop culture aficionados, some would say, and devoted actress fans. We come, we break bread with each other, sometimes together, sometimes remotely, and we talk about all the things that we love, all the things that we hate, what we're watching, what we're hate watching, what we're reading, what we're listening to, what we're seeing in the theater. And then afterwards, we introduce a wonderful interview with a really underrated actor on our show. So welcome aboard. I am so glad to be back here with you this week, Damien. And before I go any further, I just wanted to say, I think the screen on your TV just changed in the background, but it was on like Bad Boss Baby or whatever. <laughs> oh, I'm was. caught. I'm and caught. I was like, are you, are you watching Bad Boss? What is that movie? Uh, baby Bosses? Baby Boss. It is something like that. Boss Baby, Baby Boss. I was confused that that's like what you were watching on Indigenous People's Day. It's a screensaver on the Roku TV. Okay. And I was watching, I don't don't even know probably work in progress i think had it queued up and actually you just missed there was an image of the l word generation q i thought you were going to comment <gasps> on that oh here's my favorite thing damien weeks ago had invited me and my <laughs> my girlfriend and all of our friends that are people that are watching l word gen q to a screening at henrietta hudson's to watch the finale it was tonight we were i texted him this morning i said damien i can't wait to go to this with you tonight he said "Ooh, sounds like fun i said you invited me <laughs> Then turns out the bar is closed till Wednesday. It happened on Friday night. So we did not watch the L Word finale together, but we will be watching it tonight. I hope some of you are L Word watchers these days. I know that we've gotten a few people into the L Word. Is anyone watching? Anyone out there? Are you watching the L Word? Hello. Are you watching? Are you into Gigi and Bet? Are you into Gigi and Danny? Uh, okay, in my defense of this particular, I had I, I traveled <laughs> yesterday, I woke up kind of late, I looked at my phone, I had a message that was like, you kept calling Henrietta Hudson HH, and I thought you were saying like, hey, Damien, do you want, you said like, do you want to do HH tonight? And I thought you meant happy hour. And so I said, uh, hey, did you have something okay. in mind? Or did you, and then I was like, maybe you're inviting yourself over to record to this thing that we're recording right now. And I said, <laughs> oh, we could, I could like make us martinis because we have that shared bottle of Tito's that we both, it's a great inside joke where we just bring this used bottle of Tito's until it runs out to each other's apartments. And then I, you just respond and you're like, Damien, you organized a viewing event. And guess what? The bar is closed tonight. And I said, hey, listen, in theory, I knew they were doing screenings. I thought it, would, of course, would be on the night that it airs on TV. But I guess they're doing it the night that it becomes available to stream on Showtime anytime. I mean, it's hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up. Cable providers and these streaming services are just they are fucking it all up. It's very confusing and everything. Nothing feels like an event anymore. It's impossible to find out where or how to watch something. I know that ages me and I sound old doing it, but yeah. I literally was trying to like get my father access to one of the WNBA games that I wanted him to watch. Like couldn't figure it out, had no passwords to give him and eventually just like bought a new service, created an account and like sent him the details. And then he was like, I don't know how to work this. And I thought, you know what? This is a failed system. I was just going to tell you and be honest that my brain is a little fried because I thought I was getting a migraine earlier. So I took two migraine pills and half of uh, an edible. So I am all over the place, but it made me think of the fact that I haven't yet purchased either of the things that Whoopi Goldberg is hawking. <laughs> she makes THC like salves, creams, tinctures with her daughter and has been selling them as like menstrual cramp relief for like the past six years. And then now she's hawking migraine medicine. And so I feel like me and Whoopi are simpatico. You we know, we like to say that Whoopi Goldberg takes any job, but I do think these are two things that are close to her heart and also to mine. You need to get your GP to get you on that prescription, on that RX. Yeah, I'm not going to name your, I'm not going to name your GP because she did misdiagnose an STD <laughs> that I had once. <laughs> it was very complicated <laughs> and frustrating. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to put air her out, but I will air my own dirty laundry out. She was not the right doctor. <laughs> For you. <laughs> I literally got okay. It's so it's I was I was like in like in doctor's offices for like six months and it was like, oh, it was an STG. <laughs> I remember reading in like history books like people died of gonorrhea. Yeah, I would be or, like, dead. Many, died of syphilis. I would be dead so many deaths. 
It's like, oh, what a terrible way to go. I remember reading <laughs> as a, like a textbook, probably sex ed, they were trying to scare you away from anything like in ninth grade. And it was about somebody getting gonorrhea of the eye. And that was like a running joke for like five years with me and my high school friends about getting gonorrhea of the eye. Now it seems like a real possibility. So speaking of old time diseases, actually I was Googling the other day to see, I was like, where is the status of a vaccination for gonorrhea? <laughs> but speaking of old timey diseases you could die of, you know, I'm very excited about this week's guest. If you know Anne or me on... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just laughing at the introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To someone that we're so excited about. No, no, no. Keep it in. Just go, Keep it in. Go with it. it. Go with it. It pleases it's me. Go with it, it pleases we're, me. I'm, I'm talking about scarlet fever. I'm talking about gonorrhea. I'm just lumping them all together. They're all old timey. We're going to add the croup in there because that's what Minnie, Minnie May had. Is that right? Minnie May? Yeah. I don't Minnie think, May. I think it's different. In a, I did a play version of Okay, So I did a play version of Anne of Green Gables in high school. So I'm going to tell you about my own personal connection to Anne of Green Gables. Mm, you want it. Okay. As a young person in elementary school, it was one of the like the, the mini series, the first two were things that substitute teachers or teachers would like play for our class. Sometimes like on a rainy day or a teacher was out, a substitute would put it on. Yeah. So I had a lot of affection for Anne of Green Gables as a young person. And then when I got to high school, it was we did a quote unquote, I don't know why I'm doing quotes. We did a play version of it my junior year of high school. And I got cast as a school teacher who, of course, is reads in the films as very homosexual. And so I got cast as him. And then I my theater teacher um, who recently unfriended me on Facebook. She told me I was playing the character homosexual, <gasps> which is a cool note to give a kid. You've mentioned that person on this very podcast. I didn't realize yes, she, it was about your performance well, she, in Anne of Green Gables. Well, she also told me that about my performance as Smee and Peter Pan, where she asked me to feed Captain Hook grapes and then told me I was playing him too, like he, like he was a homosexual. Oof, so oof. I tell you all of this to say that Anne of Green Gables has a real soft spot. I have a real soft spot for it. I, I think it's a beautiful book and I think it's like a wonderfully made miniseries. I also think that Anne is one of the great like literary heroines and I yes. I pose to you like what other great sort of characters like I think of the March sisters from Little Women. I think of them yes. as maybe like being yes. the American version of that, you know, and certainly mm -hmm. certainly Jane Austen has many heroines in like Brit Lit, but I was just like Anne is so representative to me of young women I grew up with like I think of all of my friends that I went to all of my secondary and high school with as like plucky smart strong minded women and so I love the series and I'm so excited for this week's episode I'm talking so much take it 100% I'm with you. The movies were very important to me. And I loved Colleen Dewhurst as a kid. And that was like my introduction to Colleen Dewhurst with the movies. And also to have, like you said, a plucky, strong, smart, steadfast heroine whose name was spelled with an E was very important to me. This week was extremely important for both of us because we landed, of course, Megan Follows, who played Anne in three of the original Anne films. We get into all of that, but we just wanted to give you a little bit of context and also about sort of how Megan has this deep attachment, of course, to the films, but then really has done her research on Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote the books, and we got to hear about that. So I feel like it really opened up this wide world for us. Damien, in fact, sent me the book that Megan mentions in our interview about Lucy Maud Montgomery. She seems like this fascinating author and like, you know, talking about people that get erased from the canon is very much in the wheelhouse of this podcast. It's part of our mission. So hearing Megan's like really in-depth nuanced answer about why Anne is still so important to her and why Lucy Maud Montgomery is so important to her. The whole thing was just a really beautiful moment that really encapsulated what we're trying to do on the podcast too. So we are so excited for you to hear this interview with the great Megan Follows. Bye, bye, bye. You might know her from Anne of Green Gables, Anne of Avonlea, Winona Earp, Heartland, Hockey Night, Shania A Life in Eight Albums, and Rain. We are here with woo, actor and director Megan Follows. Megan, welcome to You Might Know Her From. Thank you. I'm very thrilled to be here and to be meeting you guys. It's a big day for us because you are officially Canadian royalty, and we were so thrilled in our research to learn that you come from a theatrical family. So your parents, Ted Follows and Don Greenhelsch, were both actors. You and your siblings grew up in the industry. And when we were doing our research, we found theatrical credits like Top Girls, Romeo and Juliet, A Doll's House, Othello, Uncle Vanya, Fool for Love, The Effect of Gamma Rays on Man in the Moon Marigold, and a production of Night Mother with your real life mom, which is both dark and incredibly wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Though it seems like you've always had theater in your blood, you seem to really dive back into the theater in the early aughts. So even though you had an established TV and film career, what was the reason for diving back in at that point? And do you have Broadway ambitions? Ooh, I think one always has Broadway ambitions. One thing I feel really strongly and very proudly about too is I think we have extraordinary theater in Canada. I think we have a really rich history of our theater, whether it's uh, the Stratford Festival, our regional theaters, uh, Theater London in London, Ontario. I directed a production of Margaret Atwood's The Penelope Ad there a couple years ago. And Toronto is just a really rich theater community, as is in Montreal, uh, obviously incredible Francophone theater and Anglophone theater. And so it's kind of our often our bread and butter in Canada. It certainly was for my parents. I mean, that's how they raised a family. There would be television work here and there, but the majority of their work, they actually were founding members of a number of theaters across the country. My father was in the first really professional touring theater company called the Straw Hat Players back in the late 40s. And then my mom was an apprentice as a teenager uh, in the first season of the Stratford Festival when Tyrone Guthrie was there and there was a tent in the in the middle of wow. this field and I think Sir Alec Guinness was one of the you know performers in that production and they founded the the Neptune Theater in Halifax I think it was a a, a stick a meter uh, something to be held up against you know if you were going to do it you needed to be able to to really do it can you do this I assume based on some of the names mentioned then we're talking about like the plumbers, and of course, like Colleen Dewhurst, who you, of course, worked with, the great woman of the theater and Anne of Green Gables. But she also played your mom in Termini Station. Yeah. Were you and your family sort of familiar with her on a personal level? Or like, what was your relationship with her prior to Anne of Green Gables? Well, I had no relationship to Colleen prior to Anne of Green Gables. And so how extraordinarily lucky was I as a young actor to have worked with someone like Colleen, you know, as people say, just a broad of the theater, you know, yeah. no nonsense, intelligent, funny, respectful of the crew, you know, supportive of this piece. She had a piece of property, a farmhouse on Prince Edward Island, and there is a Canadian connection to Colleen, hence why Colleen got to play Marilla. Because it's kind of funny, originally what the producers wanted Catherine Hepburn had always wanted to play Anna Green Gables. I don't know if you'd ever heard of that, about that. There was a character she that, always yeah. really wanted to play. And then just the way it fell in her career was the timing didn't work out. So her great niece is Skylar Grant. They then wanted Catherine Hepburn to play Marilla and Skylar Grant to play Anne. So I was one of the first people to audition for Anna Green Gables one year. And then they went this sort of cross country, saw 3,000 young actresses. Were they going to get two, someone for her younger, older? And there was another way that the director, producer wanted to go, which was with Catherine and Schuyler. But in this case, thank God for me, Canadian funding and financing meant that it had to be a Canadian in the role. Also, PBS that then fought for me when they saw I was the first person to audition. And then 3,000 girls later, I came back in for another sort of grueling tests of auditions, got ready to jump on a plane and go back to school. And the tape had mysteriously been the sound. Something was wrong with the tape. And I had, if I wanted to audition again, I had basically 45 minutes to get down, do the buggy scene the you don't want me because I'm not a boy scene and another scene if I wanted to stay in the game. And I basically said, and my mom was a big supporter. She said, fuck it, let do it, get down there. I said, I want this. I want this to be a Canadian to play this role. And so I did. And wow. PBS saw that final tape and they went, enough already. Let, let's do her. So Skylar Grant, who was wonderful, who had never done much before. In fact, she had worked professionally at all. I don't think so. I think she'd done theater in Sebastopol, California. She played... Diana Barry. Is that last minute audition, is that the screen test that exists now? It's on YouTube. I assume it's on like a DVD feature or something as well. It's an excellent audition. I believe that is the one. Yeah. It also may be, believe it or not, the first one because I started, I, somebody sent that to me and then I looked at my sweater and I went, wait a minute, 
I think that was the audition I did when I was in, uh, I did a thing called Hockey Night. I don't know if you guys have heard about that one. Where We're I was familiar. Like, Rick Moranis, yeah. Yeah. of course. Rick was Moranis. remastered in 2016. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, you know, Kathy Yarrow, the only girl on the boys hockey team. And I was doing that when I did my first audition for Anne after like a 15 hour day or something going uptown. And I think possibly it's that audition because I then realized I recognized the sweater. Oh, nice. it's a great audition. So our listeners should really just go watch it. It's like a oh, masterclass, nice. honestly. Okay, so Megan, for our listeners, you're a two-time Gemini Award winner. You've been nominated five other times. You're a Canada Screen Award winner also three times nominated in addition, a Genie nominee, a Director's Guild award winner, and of course you've played this literary icon. How has this success in Canada translated to your Hollywood career? (laughs) Is this a loaded question? (laughs) God, it sounds so good when you say all that. I think the thing we have to remember is that even though Anne won an, Anne, the, the show won an Emmy, at the time there was a real division between the world of film and the world of television. It's going to change a few, just a few years later. It's going to completely turn around. And the snobbery that existed for being associated with television is not going to be a hurdle. We've completely changed our mind about that. So as a young teenager in LA, and I went to high school here, and I went, you know, back up to do and it was not an obvious and easy transition. Let me just put it that way. Just to close the loop here for our listeners, in case you are like, I don't even know what to call you. If you are unfamiliar, you portrayed Anne Shirley in Anne of Green Gables and its sequels, adaptations of L.M. Montgomery's beloved coming-of-age story about an orphan girl who moves in with elderly siblings in Prince Edward Island, and then they all become a family. You started to play Anne when I believe you were about 16 or 17, and then you played her for the third film, the continuing story, when I believe you're around 32. Like, what has it been to play that character for 15 years? Do you see her as different characters because of the evolution of the person? I definitely did. I mean, it was funny because I I did the first Anne when I was 17 and I had to play her from 12 to 16. And you know, I'm going to really, my mom was extraordinary. My mom found an Alexander teacher for me to help with my posture. And I remember a couple of times in the morning before going to work, it was called the mitzvah technique. Excuse me. It was a guy called the mitzvah who I believe was an Israeli dancer. And I would go and he would do table work and helping release my neck because I realized I had to walk differently as the 12 year old. And we didn't shoot that in a progression of time. I, in the morning I'd be 12 and then I'd be 16 and then I'd have my hair short from how, you know, even though I was technically still a minor, I think I'd been emancipated. So I got to work the full hours, uh, old school. Um, (laughs) right. So that was Anne of Green Gables. Anne of Avonlea basically is a shorter time frame. It's kind of all sort of in one mm-hmm. one time frame. Then I went off in my life and did different things, including having had two beautiful children. And they did a whole series, Road to Avonlea, which I had nothing to do with. So when they decided to do a third sequel, they basically somewhat arbitrarily and it's based more a little bit on Rilla of Ingleside because the timeline isn't really accurate to the books I know (laughs) I know (laughs) forgive me I'm just the actress who played the character (laughs) so it really kind of became its own thing but it was Mm. so fun again to be number one what can I say it's the real man yep I'm the one going off to war. I'm the one trying to find something. I'm the one writing a book. I'm the one falling in love. I'm the one slapping the guy. And it's so funny. And I think in the third one, I I bumped up several times with differences of opinion with um, Mr. Sullivan on that one. And there was, you know, her book is taken from her and published. And then there's some scene where the guy's out on the street, but he's so dreamy that it, you know, Anne swoons and kisses him. And I said, are you kidding me? 
This man takes her book. I'm not kissing this guy. I'm slapping him across the face. No, you can. I said, well, watch. I said to the actor, get ready. We can fake, but you're not kissing me. You stole my work. And I did. I, you know, no, slapped him. Great. It's in the thing. I said, what? <laughs> self It's iconic. It's iconic. And surely he's going to let some dude kiss her after he's stolen her material. Are you crazy? Well, thank you for fighting for that. Mm. You're welcome. I'm sure you know this. I'm sure you know this. But look, lesbians love Anne Shirley. She's plucky. As you said, she's going to slap a guy, take the taste, you know, slap the taste out of his mouth. And she also is always in a sensible boot. God love her. And of course, she has her bosom friend, Diana Barry. So be honest. Was there any part of you that was playing any of the lesbian undertones in those films? Or was it something that you sort of found out based on fan reactions after the fact? I think that especially in the first one, I think that the intensity of female friendships is something that I understand. I, I've had a best friend since I've been 13 and I'm, I have sisters. And I think that when we take Anne uh, and put it in a, v- a Victorian context, because that's when it was written, young women, girls that did not have a safe place to deeply love, express their exploration of the world, of magic, of anything physically right, with the opposite sex, first of all. I mean, it was just, you could not, there was no safety. You were not allowed to do that. It's an extremely restrictive, Presbyterian, uptight time. And now you have Mm -hmm. this, this incredible, deep expression of love. So from that point, from the childhood point, I, I could recognize that, whether, whether I think it's the same, whether two young men could have that. And particularly there, just the safety that women needed from each other. Mm-hmm. Then I think a little bit later, I, I recognized that there was this, just this incredible sort of, you know, deep appreciation that you could see, this complete commitment that a character could have to her to her girlfriend to Diana which obviously in the books are never explored beyond that you know Lucy Maud is a again writing as a product of her time so i didn't think about it that way mm-hmm. and then of course you've got immediately the the whole gilbert you know, the pressure on her to become Mrs. Gilbert Blythe and not. And I think what I really recognized was, again, damn it, I don't want to be defined by anybody. That's what I really recognized in Anne. And I think which is so interesting is why Lucy keeps pushing her getting married. She pushes it off as long as she could, and then she couldn't push it off anymore, literally because of the, of the confines of the time. And I think really the pressure's on her from her publisher. Ooh. And she was a woman who had deep, loving relationships with female friends. I think that's where she felt she could express herself. I don't know if you, if you know that in her journals, there's a really wacky episode with this fan. Do you know about this? With no. Oh, my God. Please tell me. So I think the fan's name was Isabel. And uh, this is later in life, so Lucy's already married and in a very complicated, deeply unhappy marriage. So, so sadly, in, tr- in truth, she did not ha- She married a, a Ewan, I'm forgetting Ewan's last name, forgive me. Um, she, would, she would often write fan letters back and forth. She would address her fans, and she was very grateful for people who appreciated her work. So, But there's this... What we would now a days probably call a stalker, this this young fan who was a woman who was absolutely loved the characters, loved Lucy, and whose biggest dream was to spend time with Lucy. And and eventually her biggest dream was to lay with Lucy, which Lucy did. Ah. And yet it's fascinatingly fraught with a degree of... This is something that I you would do with people, even guests when they came. Sharing a bed with a guest when you came back in Victorian times was not unusual. And sometimes there would be that that board, you know, the bunting board. Yeah. Like, but oftentimes, just because of lack of bedrooms, you didn't heat a house, whatever. And you know that this fan is, uh, and Lucy is an older woman at this point. 
I mean, there's a 25, 30 year difference between this fan and Lucy. And I just remember this whole, she puts on her Victorian nightgown and does her hair and has, you know, meetings with this young woman who she had met before and knew was like kind of a bit sycophantic with her. And then the, the stay is the weekend. And it's all very, you, you never, Lucy Maud wrote and rewrote and shaped and changed and recurated her diaries. She is fascinating, this woman. So I'll just give you that little story because part of it too is that you realize that she was longing for someone to say, Mm -hmm. you're fantastic. Her husband never read her books. Mm. Horrendous. That's that's fucking horrendous. Did you read her journal to prepare? When I did the the first sequel, Anne of Avonlea, I did read the journals. I, I used those journals a lot more to kind of understand Lucy and base her feelings. I found them really, really helpful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I have since been doing that because I've actually, am in the early stages of developing, I, I've just got the rights to a preeminent biography on Lucy Maud called Gift of Wings by Mary Rubio. And I want to develop this into a limited series and I want to play Lucy Maud Montgomery because I think she's an extraordinary hero of our time and her life ended up being quite, she was up against a just vicious level of patriarchy that tried to discredit her writing and take her down. I don't think people realize what she contributed because they tried to erase her basically and particularly in the Canadian canon at one point the voices that came in dismissed the writing as for women and uh, sentimental and Victorian and uh, the, the modernist movement dismissed the domesticity as a valid backdrop for storytelling which of course we now know is not true and writers like Margaret Atwood, Alice Munro, Margaret Lawrence, Jane Arcourt all say Lucy Maud Montgomery taught me that I had stories to tell. Carol Shields, who they were trying to do the same thing to, even not that long ago. And then she got the Pulitzer Prize for her writing. But at first they were like, oh, well, women in their kitchens and <laughs> you know, the prairies in life. And it's like, yeah, because actually that is also a hero's journey. You know? So that's what's interesting to me right now. That's incredible. We're going we're gonna to book club that so that we are prepared for this series. Our final question about Anne for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> you did not reprise your role in the fourth film, 2008, mm. A New Beginning, and Barbara Hershey took over the role. What was this about? I would have no idea because I wasn't asked. Oh. Uh, I was not asked to be involved in it. I am going to tell you, I have not even seen it. I haven't seen it no, either. We're, we're, I never watched it. No, that, I was not interested it's in not that. It's not canon in my that opinion. The me. In- that me. <laughs> I will say, though, I wish that the films were more easily able to be... I know that there's a, there was a whole back and forth with the rights of it, but I wish they were able to be streamed for younger generations. Yeah, it's a whole issue. And again, it's, it, the, the, it's interesting that in, within her life, Lucy Maud went to trial many times with the publishers who had basically stolen her rights and not honored her royalties. I mean, there's something like five very serious Mm. lawsuits where she goes back and is trying to get the money, which they've been making off of her. And it seems that that legacy of a little bit of an unscrupulous past, so the family the heirs to Montgomery and their rights were not honored by that company. I certainly had my own battles. So I think Lucy is probably smiling down going, Jesus, here we go again. So I don't know where they are, but I do know I'm incredibly proud of the work we did. And particularly that first one, I think, which was co-written by um, Joe Wiesenfeld, who did an amazing job helping Mr. Sullivan structure that first one. I think it's very timeless it's perfection and also just i'm excited about the possibility and of it being like a full circle moment for you to have this project about ellen montgomery so 
I'm so excited for that. Well, put it up. Yeah, we've got to, we've got to wait yeah, yeah, we're putting it in for the its early days, but I think it's really an important story too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Megan, you played Catherine de Medici, the wily matriarch in the CW series Reign for four seasons. And over the course of this very wild show, you got to do things like bribe peasants, plot murders and rapes, and generally intimidate and blackmail anybody in your path. You had this great quote where you said the show is the 24 of the pre-Renaissance, which I think was pretty apropos. I thought it was, I thought it got the tone of that show correct. Yeah. (laughs) Was it fun for you to dig into such a sort of conniving role? And also, what was it like being on a set, like a CW set with a bunch of 20-somethings? I loved working on Rain. Rain has been one of my favorite jobs. The cast... You know, when you're really lucky when the alchemy of, of, of a group comes together, a lot of the young actors were from Britain. They were from Britain or f- coming from the States via Australia and then the Canadians. And so we did the pilot in Ireland, first of all. So we were all strangers, in, you know, in a land and kind of needing each other to have fun. I think Toby Regbo is so beautiful in rain he plays my son francis you know i watch it again and i'm just he was he was 20 i think when he started he had also not done much just this extraordinary beauty that he brings adelaide kane was unbelievable she was like you know it's a grind because that's 22 episodes it's you know it's old school it's not Mm. like a limited series they get to think about how they want to structure 10 episodes and what we want to do it's like do the pilot okay off we're going good okay are, and those writers are like in a writer's room. God bless them. And then they're not sure. Are we only going to get 13? Is it going to end? So no, we get the back nine. Oh, great. Oh, shit. We could have we could have waited. We didn't have to have the Mary now, you know. So now right. we kind of shot ahead and then they had to put the brakes on to basically go, now what are we going to do? That's when it became the 24 of, of the Renaissance. Cause it's like, <laughs> we, had this, we had to wait, spread it out because we knew, we knew that, that historically, although we... You guys took a little bit of liberties. Fantasy, we play, yeah. yes, we, I, you know, uh, historical fantasy, I like to call it. Oh, um, yeah. But that's what's fun about, that's what's fun about those kinds of shows yeah. because it like plays into the costume dramery of it all. But then also it's like, gets to be a little campy. Well, it was honestly like, it was like Bridgerton before Bridgerton, right? Exactly. Because we had a contemporary soundtrack. We're all sort of in a mixture of, you know, fun, ye olde clothes slash Gucci dresses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I loved it. I had a blast. So, Megan, over the last six years, you've also, in addition to your acting work, have gone behind the camera and to direct. Starting with series you appeared in, like Rain, The Republic of Sarah, Heartland, Murdoch Mysteries, but also Holly Hobby, The Charmed Reboot. Your first feature, Maternal, is also in post-production, which we we're very excited about. Something that was an interesting observation is Rain and Heartland both had female showrunners, and so did Winona Earp, which you also acted on. Did working on those series spark anything in terms of your directing career, or was it always in the cards? No, I would say I I always wanted to do it and hadn't had the opportunity to do it. And because then I had been in the theater, the first job I ever directed was a play. So my first was uh, the English language premiere of a French Canadian play called The Carousel, The Carousel by uh, Jennifer Tremblay. And it's a very uh, complicated one woman show that starred Allegra Fulton. And I did that in Toronto. And I did that actually while I was doing Rain in the first season. Rain was one of the first shows where they had also put the mandate in of having to have a number of female directors. I worked with oh. more women directors on Rain than I had in the previous 30 years of my career. That's insane. Wow. It's insane and it is true. Lori McCarthy, who was a female showrunner, was supportive and I got the opportunity to direct on Rain and then the network really liked what I did and the next season came and I said I want to direct again. They said yes, I said I want to direct two episodes. Why not just be greedy, you know? And there were other voices, I will say, that were male. I said, well, you can't. I, we're gonna, and I said, well, I went to Lori and I said, if, I, if you like what I do with, in season four with episode 
406. Will you hold one in the back nine for me? Yes. And she did. So I got to do that. And they were two of their very successful episodes. So definitely had to have a champion mentorship. Frank Syracusa, who was one of the producers on Rain 2 in the early days, was was supportive of me uh, crossing over and doing that. You gotta have you gotta have champions in this business. It's just really, really brutal. It's hard. Okay, Megan, you were nominated for a Gemini, which again for our American listeners is like the Canadian equivalent of the Emmy, mm-hmm. for playing Shania Twain's mother Sharon in the T V movie Shania Twain, A Life in Eight Albums. We looked everywhere. I contacted every black market bootlegger that I know. I couldn't find the movie anywhere and I was very frustrated. But we've talked about how you're a Canadian superstar. What was it like when you got the call to be a part of another Canadian icon's life? Did you have any hesitations? You know what is so funny? I was cleaning out my closet and I came across a box of CDs and DVDs. And in that, and this was literally not last night, but maybe the night before, I found a copy of Shania Twain, A Life in Eight Albums. I got send it to us. I, I, I'll, I'll, pay you, you I'll pay for the postage. I'll pay for the postage. I will send it to you guys. Okay, great. That is hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to send you a self-addressed stamped envelope. I will send it to you guys. I, you know, I love when we honor and explore our our stories in Canada. You know, it's interesting when you have a very powerful neighbor on your border who also has extraordinary stories to tell, but to keep finding and celebrating ours and literally fighting for the air waves at the time and the space for that. So Shania is obviously someone who's cro- is an international name and came from a very, you know, tough background because she was living at one point in very severe poverty and her mom was fighting very serious addiction. So she really is a story of someone who fought for everything she got, Shania. And I, you know, I I have a lot of big hair. I have a lot of big hair and then I have short gray hair in it. Okay. I really, I can't wait to see this DVD. This is why you have to hold on to a DVD player. You do. I know. And every and every ten years, go through your closet and look at those things and go, "Oh my God, why do I still have a picture of them?" You know, and then, right? Like, <laughs> what you're going to do with that? <laughs> okay, Megan follows. We have entered the part of the show that is rapid fire. It is rapid fire for us, so that we can get everything else we need to talk about with you out. You can <laughs> take your time if you need to. We just need to throw this out without any segues. If you want to be rapid, though, you're more than welcome to try. Okay. Okay. You've played mom to Tatiana Maslany in Bookie Makes Her Mark, Sinead Grimes in the aforementioned Shania Twain film, and Melanie Scrafano in Winona Earp. If you had to bury a body, which one of those women would you call to help you? Let's say, um, I'll probably Melanie. To bury a body? No. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying Shanae Grimes is also in the mix. Yes, I yeah, that's true. But I think Melanie, I think Melanie would know how to bury a body. Okay. We heard you talk about how much you love blocking when directing. Have you ever worked with an actor who didn't know stage left from stage right? Yeah, I, you know, I've certainly worked with actors who had completely different instincts than me, where we became two left feet. Oh. Yeah, you don't forget that <laughs> when you're in front of an audience and you slowly feel the egg dripping off your face. Yeah. Okay, Megan, you star in the 1984 coming-of-age television film Hockey Night, co-starring Rick Moranis, about a female goalie who joins the boys' hockey team. This film is beloved, and I think we mentioned it before, it was restored in 2016 and screened in Toronto and Vancouver. Very important question is, if we were to challenge you to a game of hockey right now, how well do you think you would do today? Ooh. We aren't good at hockey, though. So just no, I would not do well. I, I, I would, I would sort of stumble along and try to uh, do some ice dancing for you. But I, you strike I, me as somebody who picks up a lot, who's who's very good at picking up skills, though. Um, thank you. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I did figure skating as a kid, 
so when I did hockey night, I was able to stand on the ice at least and not fall on my face. And there was a young woman who was also the double who was a girl, a, a goalie. But I do remember the day when the crew lined up and and I was in <laughs> in front of the goal and they were firing those pucks at me on that one shot. And I did do the iconic leg goes out, glove goes out, and I catch the uh, thing. And I just said, oh, thank you, God, because if I I will never live this down, this will be the biggest walk of slinking ice off, you know, a, a slink of shame. It's not really a walk of shame. You would just, what do you call it, on skates? <laughs> okay, Megan, you play Joe's cousin Terry on an episode of Facts of Life that was a backdoor pilot. We have a lot of Facts of Life fans that listen to the podcast. Right. Terry, like Joe, is a tomboy and works with her brothers and single father in the family gas station in New Jersey and is really coming into her womanhood. You are doing this Northeastern Italian-American accent. I can relate to it. How did I do? <laughs> Very good. Okay. Have you always been adept at American dialects? And if so, which is your favorite? Well, I guess that's subjective, isn't it? <laughs> if I'm good at it. You are. You know, I think uh, my favorite, some some Southern accents are just extraordinary. I just find them really beautiful. I mean, New York is like iconic. And then, you know, when you get into like Fargo'sville, you know, Minnesota North, you know, we're kind of pretty similar to some of our Canadian sounds. Can you get like pretty granular when you get to the southern though can you like do different regional southern you know what i'd have to be i I probably off the top of my head would be really broad stroke so i'd probably offend everybody you know i mean i just can't do something and it'd be like totally Uh, and then it'd like become like valley girl oh my god i'd be like yeah that's not like southern what's happening (laughs) and then spending time in la that one always kind of i was like wow, that really is an accent. I'm like, oh, like, why are you talking about? People almost never close their mouth. And it's like, <laughs> I, I did have an agent once actually say to me, uh, what, what's that sound you have? You have an accent, Megan. What? I don't know. What is that voice you have? I just, I don't understand. Like, are you from England? What is, what, why do you sound like that? I said, you mean diction? I... <laughs> I, she never really liked me, but. Okay, Megan, you starred in the 1993 CBS drama Second Chances with Connie Selica, Michelle Phillips, and an unknown Jennifer Lopez. We play this game a lot on the show. Fuck, Mary Kill, Second Chances edition. Which of those co-stars would you fuck? Which of those co-stars would you marry? And which one would you kill? Can you, can you say them again? It's <laughs> Connie, your sister on the show. Uh-huh. Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas. And Jennifer Lopez. Okay, so I have to I have to fuck one of them, I have to kill one of them, and I have to marry one of them. Correct. Well, who doesn't want to fuck J Lo? Yeah, stunning. Yeah, I don't want to kill Michelle Phillips. But you're gonna? No. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, Connie, I'm, I'm, goodbye. Sorry. <laughs> just right. for just for history's sake. And <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, Megan, you played sex therapist and educator Sue Johansson, who is basically Canada's Dr. Ruth on the sketch comedy series Air Force Live. If you could have asked Sue Johansson a question about your sex life at one point in your life, mm. what would it be? For me, as a teenager, I would have said, am I really supposed to use my tongue to spell out the alphabet while giving oral sex to a woman? Because that's what the internet says to do. I would have asked her if I should really put an Altoid in my mouth to to pleasure a man because I also read that in like a GQ or something. Oh my God. I love Sue Johansson. I love Sue Johansson. You know, very, you know, she's just, <laughs> yeah, um, so mad ladies, I mean, if you're going to take it down there, you can't let them put it right back inside you. You have to, you got to rinse it off. I'm just going to, I mean, are you really doing it for you? Or are you doing it for them? Because, I mean, I'm just saying the tissue's not as stretch. It's not as stretch. So you got to take care of yourself. Wouldn't that have been just great? Can you imagine having her as a grandmother? Incredible. Yeah. I probably would have, God, what wouldn't you have asked her? I know. Probably even like, when I was a teenager, everybody was like, desperate to lose their virginity it's like you ha- you were supposed to lose it by a certain time and you know if you were still 16 or 15 and you hadn't lost your virginity you were like old uh, you know yeah. which i think 
what I would, you know, would have loved is someone say, well, are you ready? Do you like them? Do you, you know, is this something that you want or not? Or, you know, I still think so much of that was determined by other factors that weren't really being driven by my own desires. Yeah. If I, if I'm honest. I think Sue would have had a nice response. Mm-hmm. I, I like to think she would. I, she would. Yeah. She's, I mean, I used to, yeah, she, she had a talk show. I feel like, you know, late night talk show. Late night with Sue. Yeah, I, I don't know where I found it, but I would watch it. I would like stay up late to yeah. watch it. Like just great practical advice. After, make sure you pee. Yes, you know, to the point. Right, like no shame. No shame. Like yeah, everybody does. You know, but she was very smart about. I mean, she was always a very uh, about safe sex. Absolutely, but also sex positive, which I appreciated completely. There was no, no shaming ever. I mean, she's kind of a bit like remember Doctor Ruth. Yeah, totally. Eat that. <laughs> she was what was she Austrian? Doctor Culture Tech. She's German, I think. German, German. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you need to get a step ladder, get up there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna end on a light note, Megan. I'm a lesbian. <laughs> if you know this show, if you know this show, Damien and I consider ourselves lesbian pop culture historians. For our listeners, you starred in a short that was featured at Outfest called Where Are the Dolls, in which you make out with a woman in a bathroom. You obviously have a huge lesbian following thanks to Anne of Green Gables, but then there's also Winona Earp and, of course, that stint on the facts of life. Megan follows. Name your top three favorite lesbians. Well, Katie Lang is pretty fabulous. Yes. Canadian lesbian icon. God, only three? Um, well, <laughs> take us out with ten. Uh, you know, we'll take what okay, we got. Anne-Marie McDonald. I love Anne. Okay, her yes. friend. I love her. I've worked with her. She's extraordinary. And uh, my God, well, I'm thinking. And then I have. I mean, I have to say her wife because she's my friend too, Alicia Palmer, who directed <laughs> me and my mother in Night Mother. <gasps> yeah, that's Alicia Palmer who directed and directed me in Top Girls. Uh-huh. We're very excited to come see you in Toronto. Now, once we learned about your Toronto theatrical sort of connection, we're going to take a flight once we're in a safe place and you're back on stage. Yay. I'd love to. Yeah, I, I look forward to getting on stage again, to, I have to say. What a treat, guys. What a blast. You're so lovely. This has been a dream come true. Megan Follows, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. have a moment please click into the show notes right now and go watch megan follows audition for anne of green gables oh when you see a young actor an actor of any age honestly that has what i'm calling that sort of it factor it's like to me it's a twinkle in the eye she has it it reads so clearly she is so powerful to watch on film and hearing that she is also i mean we learned so much about her theatrical history and we just learned actually that her father ted follows passed away actually on my birthday which was just recently in september so our condolences to megan and to their entire family they have such a rich canadian theatrical history we're ready to get on a flight if Megan ever does Night Mother with her mother again. We are in Toronto opening night. Folks, if you have been listening to this podcast, you know this thing that we do where we connect this week's guest in sort of a blind item to next week's future guest. So this week, Anne, do you have our connection from Megan to next week's mystery guest? Why, Damien? Yes, of course I do. As you know, we're never connecting this week's guest to next week's guest with any men, so get ready for an all-woman connection. Here we go. Megan Fowles was in Anne of Green Gables with Colleen Dewhurst, who was in Dying Young with Julia Roberts, who was in one of my favorites, Mother's Day. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it. It's on Netflix. It's insane, that wig, with Jennifer Aniston, who is in my current favorite hate watch show the morning show with reese witherspoon who is of course the star of sweet home alabama with sweet mary Kay place as her mother former guest of the show mary Kay place starred in diane opposite next week's guest (gasps) good job thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you Wow. Oh, Diane. I love Diane. Have you all watched Diane? I love Diane so much. And please watch it for the love of God. I mean, it features more than one former guest of this show at this point. Mm. Multiple. Mm. More more than two. Mm. Folks, if you like what we're doing, and I hope that you do if you are listening this far, please make sure that you are subscribed. Make sure that you're sharing this episode and make sure that you rate and review 
reviewing our episode on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts is really the best thing you can do for us to keep doing the good thing that we are trying to do. And if you're as invested in the Whoopi Goldberg, Barbara Corcoran tragedy that happened last week, please follow us on social media at Damian Bellino and at Rodeman on all mediums. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. You might know her from us produced by us. That is Anne Marilla <laughs> Cuthbert type Rodeman. Am I a Marilla? Am I a Marilla type? I think type? so. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Thank and, you. And, Earthy. De- and Damien, Mr. Phillips, too faggy for my <laughs> high school theater director, <laughs> Bellino. We love producing this podcast. And we also want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. We absolutely could not do it without them. That would be Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. They are wonderful. They are compassionate. They are smart. They are the best sounding boards. And all of that editing you hear, all of that crystal clear editing is also by Daniel Sears. He is a Daniel of all trades, truly. Forever thanks to Gang, who create the music that you hear under each and every episode of You Might Know Her From. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to music. And like I said, get into those show notes. The fucking Barbara Corcoran-ness is exploding all over it. That's where the audition tape resides. There's so many goodies. Get into it. So I have a question. Tell me. Ask me. My mom My mom was going to go on a rant and I sent it to you via voice <laughs> note. I just like video, I recorded her talking about it, but she was like basically Didn't like- Didn't you love each of us recording our parents against their will? She was like, fuck- Fuck, basically saying fuck Felicity Huffman for not being hum- having humility about her role in like the college admission scandal, but like had more compassion for Lori Laughlin, who at least like admitted her wrongdoing. And I just wanted to see your position. I thought that was a hot take because honestly, <laughs> did Lori Laughlin like really apologize? And Felicity Huffman, I was disappointed. Honestly, I really enjoy her. I like her a lot. I was disappointed to learn the news. But I think when she did finally come out with her apology, I thought it was one of the best public apologies I had seen in a long time. Truly. I went, you know, from like low to high to low, back to high for her in terms of culpability, taking responsibility for her actions. I thought that was key. Lori Laughlin's back on Hallmark. I haven't seen Felicity acting recently. Like, what did Lori, how did Lori Laughlin apologize? Also, where is, where are Patty's facts coming from? You got to call her. She's been telling me you haven't texted her back. So please text her <laughs> back and get into it. <laughs> okay, get into I'm it honest. about Flicka. 